It's market day in Dahabon, here on the Massacre River, which separates Haiti and the Dominican Republic. The border hasn't opened yet, but hundreds of Haitians try to beat the clock to set up their stalls first, over here on the Dominican side. Finally, it's 8 a.m., official opening time. The ancestors of the Haitians and the Dominicans have shared the island of Hispaniola for five centuries. This was the first place in the New World to import Africans as slaves. The island is the birthplace of the black experience in the Americas. But standing here on the Dominican side of the border, the differences between the two countries couldn't be clearer. It's 8 o'clock on market day on this side of the river. It's 7 o'clock over there. They speak Spanish on this side of the river. They speak Creole over there. The people on this side of the river are proud to be part of a mixed race society. There, they're proud to be black. Haitians and Dominicans have had many conflicts over the years. This river was the site of one of the worst massacres in the history of the Caribbean. And I'm here to discover how all this came about. I've come to Santo Domingo, the capital of the Dominican Republic, the oldest European city in the New World, the first in the Americas to import African slaves. Every Sunday evening, people come to the heart of the old city to dance merengue. The roots of merengue are as mixed as the people. It is the symbol of the Dominican Republic. Francis Santana has been singing merengue for 67 years. Merengue has changed a little. It is played faster now. Before, you could put your arm around a girl if you were in love. You would embrace her and dance closely together. Now, one is over here, the other over there. <laughs> The Dominican people are a rainbow of blacks and tans and browns. What is it about Dominican Republic that created the conditions for merengue to be born here? Merengue is a mixture of the music of the African slaves. The Spanish with their guitar and the Guira, which is Dominican. They mixed up their instruments to make a typical Dominican merengue. It's our music. We feel it is ours. This is our life. Without merengue, we can't live. Merengue is the life, the soul of the people. Santo Domingo feels unmistakably Spanish. Founded in 1496 by Christopher Columbus's older brother Bartholomew, the city was the first seat of Spanish colonial rule in all of the Americas. Dominicans are especially proud of that Spanish heritage. In Columbus Square, opposite the first cathedral in the Americas, sits a monument 
to the man who first colonized this island. Christopher Columbus certainly has pride of place here in the heart of Santo Domingo. And it says something about the country's sense of itself. Spanish, Catholic, and if not exactly white, then most certainly not black either. I'm curious why there are no statues of famous black heroes here, even though 90% of the Dominicans are Afro-descendants. How do Dominicans see their African heritage, their blackness? Juan Rodriguez, an anthropologist, works for the Ministry of Culture as its director of cultural diversity. How would people describe you, given your beautiful uh, mahogany color? Well, here I am as Indio. Indio. I'm supposed to be Indio here. Help me to understand, as an American, i would never heard of this phrase, Indio. Where does it come from? Well, by the 19th century, we didn't have any native indigenous people. No like in South America, so it didn't apply to us. But it was a way to use the word Indio to actually negate our African ancestry mm -hmm. and then became something else. Because when you look at Dominicans, we cannot say, honestly, that we are Anglo-Saxon. <laughs> if you look around, I mean, look at me. I am black. You are black. Did you feel this way, Juan, when you were growing up, or did you, did you have to learn that you were black? Actually, and I am sad to say, I had to learn to be black. How did you learn? Well, I went to New York, That'd as most it. Dominican, <laughs> and all of a sudden I felt that my roots were in Africa, not in Spain, like here. <laughs> Even today, here, everybody said, the, mother, the motherland here is Spain. So who's black in Dominican society? In America, all these people would be black. But here, who's black? Well... Negro. Who's Negro? I think nobody's Negro here. If we are told you are black, oh, no, I'm not black. I am something else. Dominicans are in complete denial of who they are. Look at this. For Dominicans, this represents African heritage, sambos. This is not, nothing but sambos. So that explains why people the way it, it, we, they portray Africans, why a kid would not say, I am African, because that's what they give you, that's what they show you. <laughs> In the United States, most Dominicans would be considered black, but here many call themselves Indio, a term unique in the Caribbean covering many gradations of brown. And when they think of the motherland, it's Spain that comes to mind, not Africa. And these attitudes have their roots in the earliest days of the colony. One of the first sugar plantations in the Americas was located here in Nagua. Hundreds of African slaves worked this plantation. But the Santo Domingo sugar industry didn't last long. Within just a century, the center of sugar production shifted to Brazil. To survive, the colonists abandoned the sugar plantations and turned to cattle ranching. That's when the unique racial identity of Dominicans began to evolve. Frank Moya Pons is one of the Dominican Republic's most eminent historians. As cattle ranching became the dominant occupation, Slaves had to be used as ranchers, too. And there was very little difference between the master and the slave. They both were riding horses. They, were, they both were wearing machetes. So master-slave relations became quite uh, different from the rest of the Caribbean. You know, slavery in plantation society works differently than slavery on cattle ranching society. Less antagonism between less antagonism and the behavior towards the slave uh, was different from on the, on the part of the, of the masters. After the collapse of the sugar industry, many white people left Santa Domingo. The colony increasingly depended on black people and mulattoes 
to fill the ranks of the army, the church, and the bureaucracy. They came to be known as whites of the land, and their loyalty was to the Spanish crown. As being the oldest colony, there was this myth that this was uh, the most Spanish of all colonies in the New World, despite the fact that the population was not, did not look Spanish. But if you look into the official documents, they, all of them, no, most of them normally claim from the most Spanish and loyal city of Santo Domingo, or colony of Santo Domingo. That created, I would say, an ideological superstructure of Spanicity, or Hispanicity no matter how dark your skin was. But not everyone embraced this putative Spanish identity. There are places in Santo Domingo where the African cultural legacy proudly survives. Followers of the Holy Spirit of the Congo drums of Via Maya are a unique Catholic brotherhood. They believe that the Holy Spirit miraculously gave their ancestors certain African musical instruments. Roman Migne is the head of the brotherhood. The Brotherhood has been handed down from generation to generation. My great-grandmother, who was called Maximiliana Meniel, was 12 when she was named the Queen of the Brotherhood of the Holy Spirit of the Congos of Villamella. We've had this tradition for over 500 years. This family has asked the Brotherhood to commemorate the seventh anniversary of a family member's death. UNESCO has declared the Brotherhood part of the oral patrimony of humanity, a protected status given to endangered cultural practices. Some Dominicans reject their African heritage and are shy about claiming a black identity. The reasons for this are rooted in their struggle for independence. Attention. On February 27, 1844, at Puerto del Conde, the gate of the count, Patriots raised the flag of an independent Dominican Republic for the very first time. Professor Silvio Torres Salant of Syracuse University showed me around the Independence Park. Silvio, paint a picture for me. What did it look like here on that day in 1844? It's a, it was an old building uh, which had political significance. It was here that people congregated to actually declare the, the official birth of the Dominican Republic. Hmm. The Dominicans, however, weren't declaring their independence from Spain, but from their island neighbor to the west, the new black country of Haiti. Haiti, founded in 1804 by former French slaves, occupied Santo Domingo in 1822. Haiti's 20-year occupation had a profound impact on Dominican national identity. During those 22 years of Haitian unification or occupation, depending on your point of view, yes. did the national character of the eastern part of the island change? National in terms of uh, solidification of the idea of being a, a, a separate people. Yes, it, it evolved. You know, the Haitian government imposed French as the uh, language of instruction. Mm -hmm. The Haitian government took particular actions against uh, the church, economic actions against uh, the Catholic church. Mm -hmm. The people here were a Catholic people. Mm -hmm. uh, so the Haitian government was taxing the people the, and the institutions in the East. That is correct. And, and this angered everyone. It angered everyone. So in terms of people, Dominicans uh, recognizing themselves as a people, you could say, yes, this is a period when, when that could be seen as emerging distinctly. They said, we're not like them, we we're are not. different people. That's right. Once they freed themselves from the Haitians, 
Many Dominicans did their best to reject just about everything about them, their language, their culture, and to some extent, their color. So this is uh, George Washington, John Adams, and Alexander Hamilton. That's correct. In the center you have Juan Pablo Duarte, who is the intellectual architect, if you will, of Dominican nationhood. So he's the theorist. He's the theorist. Okay. So are they all white guys? Uh, he is a mulatto. Oh, he doesn't look very mulatto in that statue. No, he doesn't. Uh, and that reflects a tendency in the imaginary of the uh, Dominican ruling elites who have a, this a tendency to want to whiteify uh, their heroes if their heroes are too black. So they whiten the brother? Yes. Not only they put him in marble, but they change his features. That is correct. And that actually is a, is a way of pointing to the uh, complexity of uh, race, race uh, relations and, and, and the racial experience of Dominicans. In the early 20th century, the Haitians came back, not as soldiers this time, but as desperate migrant workers. Most of them came during the United States occupation which began in 1916, part of Woodrow Wilson's policy of extending America's influence in its so-called backyard. The Americans appropriated large tracts of land to expand the profitable sugar industry. But the wages were so low that few Dominicans would do the work. So they imported tens of thousands of Haitians. Plantation dehumanized Haitian workers. Uh, they were reduced to a condition of uh, uh, total destitution. Mm -hmm. It is there that Dominicans learned to see themselves as uh, superior. Mm -hmm. to Haitians. In other words, the Haitians became the migrant workers doing jobs that no self-respecting Dominican would do. That is correct. They became a new class. They became, they became a new class and because, the class, they were so homogeneous, uh -huh. uh, because they were so homogeneous, because they were so homogeneous in terms of their hue, mm -hmm. in terms of their phenotype, then their blackness uh, became a type of blackness which was different from that of the of Dominicans. So all of a sudden the primary opposition became between us and the Haitians. That is true. That is true. So the Haitians then become a factor of Dominican identity. Blackness became a Haitian trait and a negative term to many Dominicans. <laughs> Some Dominicans stereotype Haitians in the same way that white people once stereotyped African Americans. Racism and anti-Haitian feelings reinforce each other as if Haitians are a completely different and inferior race. These beliefs were taught in schools and repeated through state propaganda until the late 60s. One man did more than anyone else to encourage these attitudes. The country's president between 1930 and 1961, General Rafael Leonidas Trujillo. A cruel and corrupt dictator, Trujillo's power over his people was absolute. Santo Domingo's National Museum of History and Geography holds his personal effects. Uh, look at that. This was his uniform? Yes, and this was his formal uniform. Some of the things worth pointing out are the gold braids and the epaulets, also the belt where the sword will hang, which was a special and luxurious sword. Hmm. These suits were made in France. They have a very French style. 
Trujillo used anti-Haitian racism to help to forge a strong state after years of political chaos. He did everything he possibly could to claim that the Dominican Republic was actually a white nation, despite the fact that even he had Haitian ancestry. This is the gold album uh, Trujillo. It uh, was published in 1956 mm -hmm. uh, with the purpose to promote the Dominican Republic in the world. Mm. Yeah, the image of the Dominican Republic was this. <laughs> All white, not even, not even mulatto. No. No, blanco. Don't exist. No. Oh. Yeah. Jesus. Look at that. You would think it was Europe. Yeah, in, in, in his ID, uh -huh. he put on um, white. On his ID. He's white. But he was a mulatto. Ah, uh, yeah. Ah. Uh. Like me. Like you. Uh-huh. You can see the, yeah. the rose cheeks and yeah. the pits and hmm. his photos, mm -hmm. his makeup. He has makeup. And the, the pictures and the photos. Yeah. He would uh, powder his face? Powder, yeah. Lighten. Ah. Yeah, it's white powder. Ah. Like, do you use? My goodness. I'll be damned. Look at that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so the receptions. Trujillo's anti-Haitianism reached its apex here on the Massacre River, which divides the two countries. Trujillo turned on the Haitian migrants, claiming they were encroaching on the so-called purity of the Dominican motherland. His victims included Haitian immigrants, Dominicans of Haitian descent, and Dominican-Haitian families. In October 1937, Chuijo issued an order for his troops to kill all the Haitians in the northwest part of the country. When his troops arrived, they closed the border. Even as the Haitians fled across the aptly named Massacre River, the troops brutally slaughtered them. In the end, approximately 15,000 Haitians lay dead. Trujillo never succeeded in entirely eliminating the Haitians. Today, there are more than a million Haitians living and working here, a source of continuing tension. And like migrants everywhere, the Haitians have come here pursuing the dream of a better life. To a large extent, Dominicans' ideas about race have been formed from their negative views about Haitians. I want to see what Haiti is like for myself. So I'm heading to the western tip of Hispaniola, to Haiti's capital, Port-au-Prince. Nothing but nothing prepares you for the devastation in Port-au-Prince. The earthquake that killed over 220,000 people has left one and a half million people homeless. Entire families are living in tents with no electricity, no running water, and no sanitation. Long before the earthquake, Haiti was the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. But even within this devastation, I can also see the courage and resilience of the Haitian people, desperately attempting to rebuild their lives. It's a resilience born from an extraordinarily rich and noble history. Haiti was once a colony of France. Rising from the earthquake's rubble, one can still see the monument celebrating Haiti's founding fathers and national heroes. But these aren't the European colonizers I saw in the Dominican Republic. Rather, they are black men. The men who made Haiti the first independent black nation in the New World. 
the first black men in history to defeat their colonial masters in war. We're all very familiar with the popular images of Haiti that we see on television. Poverty, food riots, military coups, tremendous instability, and of course, the devastating impact of the earthquake. But how many of us know anything at all about Haiti's noble heritage? The fact that it was a center for the fighting of freedom in the 18th century, and the fact that Haiti possesses one of the greatest cultures in the entire new world. That's what I'm here to find out about. And despite the devastation, that culture is being maintained all over Port-au-Prince. At the partly destroyed National School for the Arts, I come across an extraordinary sight. Young people still hungry to learn the arts practiced by their African ancestors. Louis Leslie Marcelin, known as Zal, is the school's head of percussion. Haiti is a country of imitation. So many different ethnicities have come from Africa, and we Haitians have imitated them all. And that is why we have so many musical styles. For example, when you take a sect like Daomé, a northern heritage, that is Daomé voodoo, which comes from Benin. When you take Nago, which we inherited from the north, from Gonaïve, that comes from Nigeria. Because we are descended from so many places in Africa, Everything Africa had to offer, we inherited. Creole, the language most Haitian people speak, is partly based on 18th century French, but it has strong elements from various West African languages. understand the history of Haiti, I'm leaving the devastation of Port-au-Prince and traveling to the northern side of the island, to Cap Haitien, Haiti's historic second city. Cap Francais, as it was then known, was the first permanent French settlement on Hispaniola. The French took advantage of the weakness of the Spanish in Santo Domingo to found their own colony in the West. When the island was formally divided in 1697, Cap Haitien became the commercial hub for the French side. It became the main port of entry for the growing trade in African slaves. The number of Africans shipped to Haiti during the slave trade is staggering. 774,000, 300,000 more than came to the entire United States during the slave trade. Haiti was the richest colony in the entire New World. It was the jewel in France's crown. The reason for this fabulous wealth sugar. Walking around Cap Haitien's historic market, it's difficult to imagine just how important Haiti was to France. Haiti was known as the Pearl of the Antilles. By the mid-1700s, this colony, little bigger than Maryland, produced nearly half the world's sugar and generated two-fifths of France's overseas trade. A brutally efficient plantation economy led to a very different way of life here than on the Spanish side of the island. 
Guy Alexander, a sociologist, is also the former Haitian ambassador to the Dominican Republic, so he knows both countries well. In Haiti, there was a plantation economy linked to the exploitation of a large number of African slaves. Whereas in the Spanish part, the slave rate was infinitely lower and the economy was based on livestock. This meant there were major differences in the process of population formation, differences from the outset with a much higher rate of race mixing in the East than we had here. How does this difference between the countries and the people express itself in relationship, say, to traditional forms of black culture, let's say, to Africa? The Dominican elite simply rejected, almost completely, the African component of their culture. The Haitians, and specifically the Haitian elite, accepted their African origins, to the point where our African origins are part of the national culture. Come to the village of Trou de Nord, just outside Cap Haitien, for the yearly celebration of the town's patron saint, St. James. Most Haitians, officially, are Roman Catholics, but that's not all they are. Just outside the church, under the town bridge, people practice a religion that many Haitians combine with their Catholicism. The African-based faith Vodou. Hollywood movies with racist images of so-called voodoo dolls, zombies, black magic and devil worship have demonized Vodou. But Vodou is a complex belief system, a religion as sophisticated as any other religion. In many of the New World black societies, it's not respectable to admit that you practice voodoo. But here, people are very proud, they seem to be. Of course, sure, we're very proud. Why? In fact, we cannot even see ourselves differently. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's the only way we see ourselves. In fact, let me say that uh, what characterizes the Haitian nation as a nation is the pride they have for their forefathers and for the heritage. When other people say, come on, you poor, we know we are rich in our own ways. We are rich spiritually. Max Beauvoir is a biochemist, trained at City College in New York City and the Sorbonne in Paris. For the past 30 years, he's been the Hungan, the high priest of one of Haiti's most important home fours, or Vodou temples. Max believes that Vodou's embrace of nature places it at the core of Haitian identity. I would say it's the aim, the aim of Voodoo. When Voodoo was constructed itself, the point was to include into it each group. Each African. So in fact, uh, Senegal was part of it, Mali was part of it, Dahomey mm -hmm. was part of it, mm -hmm. uh, the upper Nigeria was part of it, southern Nigeria with the Igbos mm -hmm. were also part of it. What we have the the northern Congos with Cameroon and Gabon, mm -hmm. they were also part of it. Mm -hmm. So in fact, I think uh, that was the basic strength of Voodoo. It was inclusive, the embracing. The inclusive. Like other oppressed people, the slaves drew solace and comfort from their religion. Voodoo also gave them strength, courage, organization, and leadership, qualities that help the Haitian people realize their greatest achievement, the defeat of their colonial masters, the French. In the countryside just outside Cap Haitien sits Bois Cayman, the forest of the alligators. Today it's just a modest village. There's nothing here to commemorate the momentous events that took place more than 200 years ago not even a plaque. 
This is where the Haitian Revolution was conceived, a revolution that would result in the creation of the first free black republic on earth. And it all began with a voodoo religious ceremony held on this very spot. Anthropologist Rachel Beauvoir, who is Max Beauvoir's daughter, has researched the events of that night using oral accounts passed down for generations. Rachel, August 14th, 1791, it's midnight. Tell me what happened here under this tree. Thunder, lightning, the whole place is trembling. The earth seems to shake. <laughs> and that's when they get together in this voodoo ceremony and everyone together says, it's over, slavery's over. They did a sacrifice of an animal, which was a black pig. Mm. And this sacrifice, everyone touched the blood. And this was the sacred oath that above everything, liberty was most important. <laughs> The Haitian slaves confronted one of the most powerful nations on earth. For black slaves to have the wherewithal to overthrow their white colonial masters was unthinkable. The principles of the French and American revolutions inspired many of the leaders. Many of the slaves drew their strength from the pride in their African past expressed in the belief in the power of voodoo. What is the role of voodoo in the revolution? Voodoo represented the cement that got all of those slaves coming from so many different areas, mm. the continent of Africa. Haiti is like a microcosm of Africa. Yeah. And the glue was and voodoo. And the glue was voodoo, making sense of it all and making everyone make sense of every other one. And then they had the unity necessary to have the most powerful slave revolution in the whole world. The Bois Cayman Uprising marked the beginning of the greatest slave revolt in the history of the New World. It took the slaves just two years to win their freedom, forcing the French to abolish slavery. Haiti was run by the great general Toussaint Louverture, still as a French colony, but free of slavery. But in 1802, the French, under Napoleon Bonaparte, reversed the emancipation of the slaves. Toussaint was tricked and arrested and then sent to a French prison where he died in exile. The Haitians rose up against the French once again to stop the reimposition of slavery. At Vertier, just outside Cap Haitien, the Haitian forces under Jean-Jacques Dessalines Toussaint's successor routed the French army for the last time. This brilliant general, a former slave himself, was determined that slavery would never return to Haiti. When he declared independence on January 1st, 1804, his stirring words left nothing to chance. Let them tremble when they approach our coast. If not from the memory of those cruelties they perpetrated here, then from the terrible resolution that we will have made to put to death anyone born French whose profane foot soils the land of liberty. Jean-Jacques Dessalines, Declaration of Independence of Haiti, 1804. These words are startling to us today, even somewhat frightening, but they're certainly understandable. Dessalines felt that the French, given any opportunity, would reimpose slavery on this island. And you know what? Dessalines was absolutely right. And he thought, perhaps mistakenly, that unless he wiped them out, slavery would return. So shortly after reading this statement, Dessalines ordered the massacre of the French people on this island, um, an act that shocked not only the nations of Europe and the United States, of course, but even many of his peers. Two years later, Dessalines himself would be assassinated by the very generals with whom he defeated the French.
But for the Haitian people, the fight to retain their independence had only just begun. No sooner had they won their freedom from France than their enemies began a campaign to strangle the new republic in its crib. Sans Souci, a remarkable fairy tale palace in the countryside just outside Cap Haitien, was built by Dessalines' successor, King Henri Christophe. A brilliant soldier, Christophe had fought in the American Revolution and had been Dessalines' right hand man in the war against the French. Haiti's continued survival now rested squarely on his shoulders. France, Britain, and America all refused to recognize Haiti. They could never allow it to become an example to other enslaved people in the rest of the Americas. Fearful of invasion, Christophe constructed a great fortress known as the Citadel. Built atop a 3,000-foot peak, it took 20,000 men to construct. It's still the largest fortress in the entire Western Hemisphere. Patrick Delator is an architect who was in charge of the Citadel's restoration. Oh. Hmm. Patrick, what was Christophe afraid of? The return of the French. Mm. The return of the French and going back into slavery. Mm -hmm. And uh, as soon as France would be at peace with England mm -hmm. and be at peace with the rest of the European powers, France could think of one thing to come back. Because everybody wanted Haiti to be crushed because it was black men who had freed themselves from the shackles of slavery. Yes. The pain of slavery mm -hmm. is such that whenever you're making an analysis of Haiti or the Haitian, it is there that you have to go back to. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that the quest for equality and the quest for freedom was so great that those guys, in fact, wrote it down and said that they would rather die mm -hmm. than go back to slavery. Mm -hmm. With the French expelled, the Haitian people rejected everything that reminded them of slavery. Haiti was the most profitable colony in the history of colonization. So if they could have maintained the plantation system, Haiti would have been rich. It would have been one of the world's richest economies. They systematically destroyed all the, all the means of production. Mm -hmm. Anything that had to do with slavery was destroyed. Mm -hmm. uh, and we destroyed the, the whole drainage system, mm -hmm. the road system, uh, the investment into the machinery for sugar mm -hmm. and the tree and even coffee. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically, it was solely the notion of individual survival, family survival. Then you have the platform. My God, look at this. That's it. From here, you have history at your feet. <laughs> you can see on one side the Bed Lacune, the arrival of Christopher Columbus. That's where Columbus arrived? Columbus. Take a look. On top of the mountain right there, mm -hmm. there's another fort. Uh -huh. Next to it, there's another fort. Yeah, I see. Yes. So that one could sustain a guerrilla war against any invading force. It's taking my breath away. Yes. I had no idea that it would be this awe inspiring. No foreign troops would ever test the strength of the walls of the Citadel, but they didn't need to. Haiti's enemies used other means to cripple the world's first black republic. Actually, the invasion did come, but not in the form that Christophe thought. It came in the form of trade embargoes, of blockades, and the systematic denigration of the Haitian people, the denial of the right of black people to govern themselves and no one pursued that policy with more vigor and passion than our own President of the United States, Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson called Toussaint and the Haitian freedom fighters 
Cannibals of the Terrible Republic. The French, too, did everything they could to cripple Haiti. Outrageously, France demanded reparations for its losses as the price for official recognition of the new country, threatening a blockade if the Haitians refused. Haiti had little choice. Incredibly, it paid France more than one billion dollars between 1825 and 1947, effectively bankrupting its treasury. One form of slavery replaced another. Foreign intervention in Haiti's affairs would become even more blatant. On July 28, 1915, the United States Marines landed in Port-au-Prince, just as they would do in the Dominican Republic a year later. Their declared aim was to protect American and foreign interests. In other words, to ensure that Haiti paid its debt to America and France. For 19 years, the United States wielded an absolute veto over all government decisions, while the provinces came under the rule of Marine commanders. And guess who the American government picked to do the occupying? Some of the most racist Southerners it could find in the entire Marine Corps. What was the result of our illegal occupation for 19 years of this country? Our presence created political, economic, and social instability that continued to plague Haiti for the next several decades. It was inexcusable. Haitians were never really given the chance to develop as an independent nation. But not all of Haiti's problems can be blamed on foreigners. The country has also suffered from several brutal, corrupt, despotic leaders. And perhaps none epitomized this more than Haitian president Francois Papadoc Duvalier. To have peace and stability, you, you, you should have a strong man in every country. Not a dictator, not a dictator, but a strong man. Democracy is a word. It's only a word. It's a philosophy, it's a conception. What you call democracy in your own country, Another country can, can call that a dictatorship. President from 1957 until his death in 1971, Duvalier was possibly Haiti's most despotic ruler. He stole millions of dollars in foreign aid, while his private militia, the Tantan Makut, oversaw a reign of terror. The American government backed him, just as it had backed the Dominican dictator, General Trujillo, ostensibly because he was a loyal ally against communism. They consider me like a black sheep. <laughs> Bernard Dietrich was Associated Press correspondent in Haiti for much of the Duvalier period, and he made his home here. Bernard took me to Fort Dimanche, Duvalier's infamously sadistic prison, from which virtually no one ever managed to escape. Bernard, what happened here? Well, it was an old army headquarters, and uh, it was the worst place to be under Duvalier. It was his gulag. He just put his people in there, and they died slowly. TB was the first thing to strike them, and then dysentery. And they gradually got worse and worse and died. And uh, some basically rotted to death here. What was the worst thing about Duvalier's reign of terror? Well, he allowed the country's entire talent to leave the country. And the country has never really 
survive this because you you lost all the best teachers, all the best writers. He had broken the schools uh, and he had kicked them out. Today it's hard to find much hope in the tent cities of Port-au-Prince. Haitians are still waiting for most of the $10 billion pledged in aid. But in one small way, the earthquake has offered a fresh beginning. After the disaster struck, it was the Dominicans who were the first on the scene providing aid and support. The Haitians have faced greater odds in their history. The same resilience and courage with which they defeated the French Empire can be summoned to rebuild their society and construct more prosperous lives. And perhaps now, after all these years, the world will welcome this great black republic as a full and equal partner in the community of nations. If not now, then when? It's market day in Dahabon, here on the Massacre River, which separates Haiti and the Dominican Republic. The border hasn't opened yet, but hundreds of Haitians try to beat the clock to set up their stalls first, over here on the Dominican side. Finally, it's 8 a.m., official opening time. The ancestors of the Haitians and the Dominicans have shared the island of Hispaniola for five centuries. This was the first place in the New World to import Africans as slaves. The island is the birthplace of the black experience in the Americas. But standing here on the Dominican side of the border, the differences between the two countries couldn't be clearer. It's 8 o'clock on market day on this side of the river. It's 7 o'clock over there. They speak the symbol of the Dominican Republic. Francis Santana has been singing merengue for 67 years. Merengue has changed a little. It is played faster now. Before, you could put your arm around a girl. If you were in love, you would embrace her and dance closely together. Now, one is over here, the other over there. <laughs> The Dominican people are a rainbow of blacks and tans and browns. What is it about Dominican Republic that created the conditions for merengue to be born here? Merengue is a mixture of the music of the African slaves. Founded in 1496 by Christopher Columbus's older brother Bartholomew, the city was the first seat of Spanish colonial rule in all of the Americas. Dominicans are especially proud of that Spanish heritage. In Columbus Square, opposite the first cathedral in the Americas, sits a monument to the man who first colonized this island. Christopher Columbus certainly has pride of place here in the heart of Santo Domingo. And it says something about the country's sense of itself. Spanish, Catholic, and if not exactly white, then most certainly not black either. I'm curious why there are no statues of famous black heroes here, even though 90% of the Dominicans are Afro-descendants. How do Dominicans see their African heritage? Spanish on this side of the river. They speak Creole over there. The people on this side of the river are proud to be part of a mixed race society. There, 
They're proud to be black. Haitians and Dominicans have had many conflicts over the years. This river was the site of one of the worst massacres in the history of the Caribbean. And I'm here to discover how all this came about. I've come to Santo Domingo, the capital of the Dominican Republic, the oldest European city in the New World, the first in the Americas to import African slaves. Every Sunday evening, people come to the heart of the old city to dance merengue. The roots of merengue are as mixed as the people. It is the... The Spanish with their guitar and the guira, which is Dominican. They mixed up their instruments to make a typical Dominican merengue. It's our music. We feel it is ours. This is our life. Without merengue, we can't live. Merengue is the life, the soul of the people. Santo Domingo feels unmistakably Spanish. 